Good morning. It's good to see you all. And those that are watching on the live stream, it's good to see you as well. Glad you're all with us this morning. Um, we're going to start a little earlier today, so let's stand and let's, uh, let's worship our Lord. Uh, Land's going to lead us in a wonderful song that we'll sing to our Lord, yet not I, but through Christ in May. Jesus, my Redeemer, there is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. seated.
2020 is a year that's doing everything it can to push us apart, to isolate us, to fragment us. And so all the more important right now that we would put a premium on community, that we would recognize the, uh, the importance of relationships. And yet we recognize that in the midst of what we're dealing with, especially in all of this physical distancing, community's complicated. And so as we get ready to launch our life groups in the fall, uh, we've created three different kinds of groups to kind of meet you where you are. We're calling them room groups, bloom groups, and Zoom groups. A room group is a group that obviously plans to meet in person from the very beginning. Uh, they might not meet in a room, it might be outside or in a public place, but their goal is a face-to-face -face gathering from the moment that they start their group. Uh, a bloom group is going to plant in an online format, but then grow into an in-person gathering. And so they'll be having conversations as they start their group about when it might be most feasible for them to start meeting in person. A Zoom group is going to be an entirely online scenario, and we've discovered this is actually a, a, a real feasible way for a community to still happen. And uh, you won't feel under any pressure if you're in a Zoom group uh, to eventually need to meet in person. So we're excited that we'll be able to offer that uh, for people who maybe not only are not comfortable going out yet, but maybe people who are geographically distant and still want to be a part of our community. Staying relationally connected does take some extra work right now. It's not easy, uh, but it's important and it's worth it. Uh, we're ready to launch another season of our life groups. They meet on different nights of the week, different groups of people, different areas of town or just online, different studies. We're confident that we can find a group that's right for you. Our life groups are the, the main way in which our church cares for one another. They're the main way in which we shepherd the flock. Uh, they're the main way of experiencing community in our church, and they're a phenomenal means of Christian growth as we do this thing together. Uh, we need each other because life is better in circles and because God has given us the church so that we would do life in Christ together. So when you see this logo, just click on it, or you can email me, or you can call the church. We're confident that we can find a community for you. Let's stay connected for the season ahead. Amen. Uh, good morning. Boy, it's good to be in the house of the Lord and see you guys. Uh, for those of you online, good morning. Uh, glad to have you here with us too. Um, if you would, uh, I've learned that we don't have the bulletins that I'm so used to asking people to open. So, would you be willing, uh, perhaps now on your smartphones or uh, maybe after the service, to go to stonebridge.org slash bulletin? And there uh, we have our keeping in touch forms that allows us to register attendance with us. And I, I think probably way more important, though, than registering your attendance is on there. Uh, you can share your prayer requests. What are those things that are heavy on your shoulders? It is our privilege as a staff to pray uh, every week for those, and so uh, don't rob us of that privilege of, of praying for you also. Uh, special announcement for our youngest members, uh, maybe not during the service, although, um, hey, you're the parents, uh, but I'd like to invite you uh, at some point to tune into our Kids Bridge uh, episodes. We have so much fun uh, and if you've seen them, you can tell. We have a lot of fun recording these. Uh, and these are just for you guys, uh, our youngest members of the Covenant community. And those of you who are watching online, you'll see the uh, slide. There it is. Pop up in a little while. And that means our episode is live. Uh, this week we're talking about Isaac and Abraham. Finally, uh, and I, I think with some sensitivity, uh, I'd like to ask you if you're in here this morning, uh, these things... Uh, make my face itch and fog up my glasses uh, and are absolutely necessary. And uh, I would ask, uh, even though it's perhaps a, a little literally stifling, uh, this is a way for us to protect and honor those brothers and sisters that are in here this morning that uh, may be a little more sensitive, maybe a little more uh, susceptible uh, to any viruses that might be floating around. Okay. Uh, as good as those announcements are, as important as they are, that's not why we're here this morning. Uh, we are here to discharge that sacred duty that was given to us by God himself to worship this thrice holy, this immortal, this invisible God who calls us into his presence to worship. Our call to worship today comes from the book of Hebrews chapter 4. We read this, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who was unable to sympathize with us in our weakness. Amen. But one 
who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So let us then with confidence, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. The word of the Lord. Amen. Good morning, church. Um, We have a new song. Let's stand together and we're going to teach it to you. Before we do that, let's pray together. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you, Father, for the uh, clothes that are on our backs and the food that's in our stomachs, the friends that we have, this uh, wonderful church of brothers and sisters, those that are worshiping online with us as well. Thank you, Father, for that. Um, We fall short of of your glory, Father, all the time. This song teaches us and uh, instructs us that... um, that we, um, well, you teach us and instruct us, Father, that uh, your mercy covers all of our sins. So thank you, Father, for that. Uh, we couldn't do this without you. Continue, Father, to be with the scientists and the doctors and the nurses that are caring for people and figuring the pandemic out. And I pray that you'll bring an end to this soon, that we can all be back together again. But until that time, Father, thank you, Father, for this day. May um, We are your musicians. We are your uh, congregation. And we lift all of our songs to you, Jesus. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. What love could remember No wrongs we have done Omniscient, all-knowing He counts not their sum Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Constantly roam. What father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the His life was the cost. We stood neath a debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Our sins, they are many. 
His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, we live for you. above every other name Jesus the only one who could ever save worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you God we live for you
So good to be with you all this morning, worshiping, and those of you at home. Let's all say the prayer that our Father taught us to pray, both at home and here right now. Would you say this with me? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's good words. Children and the 
scripture this morning is from the book of Zechariah, chapter 12. Hear the word of the Lord. A prophecy, the word of the Lord concerning Israel. The Lord who stretches out the heavens, who lays the foundation of the earth, and who forms the human spirit within a person declares, I am going to make Jerusalem a cup that sends all the surrounding peoples reeling. Judah will be besieged as well as Jerusalem. On that day, when all the nations of the earth are gathered against her, I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock for all the nations. All who try to move it will injure themselves. On that day, I will strike every horse with panic and its rider with madness, declares the Lord. I will keep a watchful eye over Judah, but I will blind all the horses of the nations. Then the clans of Judah will say in their hearts, the people of Jerusalem are strong, because the Lord Almighty is their God. On that day, I will make the claims of Judah like a fire pot in a wood pile, like a flaming torch among sheaves. They will consume 
all the surrounding peoples right and left, but Jerusalem will remain intact in her place. The Lord will save the dwellings of Judah first, so that the honor of the house of David and of Jerusalem's inhabitants may not be greater than that of Judah. On that day, the Lord will shield those who live in Jerusalem, so that the feeblest among them will be like David, and the house of David will be like God, like the angel of the Lord going before them. On that day, I will set out to destroy all the nations that attack Jerusalem, and I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on to me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child, and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. On that day, the weeping in Jerusalem will be as great as the weeping of Hadar Rimon in the plain of Megiddo. The land will mourn, each clan by itself, with their wives by themselves, the clan of the house of David and their wives, the clan of the house of Nathan and their wives, the clan of the house of Levi and their wives, and the clan of Shemai and their wives, and all the rest of the clans and their wives. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> you know, I was thinking about why one of the reasons why I uh, don't like to wear a mask is because I have to smell my own breath. And then I realized, oh, that's a great way to love your neighbor because now you don't have to smell my breath, right? Uh, <clears throat> the random things that I think about is, is what that is. <laughs> Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we begin this morning. Heavenly Father, we pause now to seek your wisdom as we approach this passage. My prayer is that I would be receptive to your word. That my pride, that my selfishness, that my arrogance would be shown and removed. Lord, I know my own heart is often bent toward how someone else needs these words, how somebody else better be listening, and yet that self-righteousness blinds me to the corners of my own heart that need to be turned over to you. I can be so quick, we can be so quick to anger and offense towards someone that, that we perceive as, as ignorant or less than or not right or determining our opinion of a person before realizing what you say in James 3.9. Father, help us to love you enough to humble ourselves before one another. May we confess these things that we have said and done that have damaged our brothers and sisters. Lord, you call us to wash one, another, one another's wounds, to be a healing community, and yet we so often limit that washing and that healing to our safe groups that we like and are like-minded with. I pray we would learn to love like you love. Cause us to become uncomfortable with surface-level friendships. Help us to yearn and hunger for deep fellowship that is real and can be seen and that will light the way for those who are in darkness. Pray that you would set ablaze in our hearts a passion for you, a passion for your people, a passion for your church. Lord, make us one. May we rejoice when others rejoice. May we weep when others weep. Lord, make us one for you and for your glory. I pray that we would, like Paul writes in Romans 14, act in love toward each other. That we would make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification, to build each other up. I pray that we would take care that the rights of ours do not somehow become a stumbling block to others. May we be instruments of your peace, of your joy, of your hope, of your light, of your grace and your mercy. I pray that you'd pour out your spirit of grace and mercy on us, that we might live into it and that it would flow out of us to others around us. And now, Lord, may your word show us truth. May it expose our rebellion. May it correct our mistakes. May it train us to live your way, God's way, to live well, to live wisely, and to live humbly. In the freeing, saving, and powerful name of Jesus, I pray this. Amen. 
Emily Dickinson wrote, Hope is the thing which feathers with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tunes without the words and never stops at all. I love that quote because I think it captures the essence of Zechariah 12 and the essence of hope. It's the tune that continually encourages us. And in Zechariah 12, we have a prophetic message that the goal is to engender hope in his people. A prophetic message to encourage you as the people of God. To look ahead and to see how God will defend his people. How God will shield his people. How God will uplift his people. To have hope in the great work of God on behalf of his people. That God is for you. That God is for me. That God is for his people who call on him. Zechariah 12 stands to act as an encouragement in the midst of the overwhelmedness. That's not a real word, but I have now just coined that word. And yet this prophecy also leaves before us a call to renewal. To the working of God in our hearts, in our lives, an internal renewal that then stimulates and fosters the same grace and mercy to the people around us and the, same, the call to obedience. See, this prophecy is, is, is rooted in it's God's defense, God's shield, and yet our rejection of him. The God who defends and shields, and yet we reject. And my hope today is, my call today is that we would not move too quickly to our claims of victory in Jesus. We do well to slow down and mourn and repent and feel sorrow because it's my sin, my rebellion that he died for. See, this chapter is in essence a call, a story of a God who protects and yet we reject. A God who defends and yet we defy. A God who rescues and yet we run away. It's the story that God is for you in spite of you. And we'll move towards that and understanding it, but I think it might be helpful to uh, understand a few things first as we move forward. Some guiding principles as we look to prophecies. We've talked about this before, but I think it always serves as a good reminder as we, as we look at prophecies within the Old Testament. <clears throat> I think in order for us to apply it to our lives, we need to understand and remember that these prophecies, these prophets, were aimed primarily at ethnic Israel. And Paul gets at in Romans 11 that there is a glorious future for ethnic Israel. And yet we are now a part of these promises. We are a part of these prophecies because as believers in Christ, we are now heirs into those promises. Romans 2.29, Galatians 3.29. And so the Old Testament prophecies and the Old Testament promises concerning Israel not only embrace ethnic Israel, but also us, Gentile believers. And finally, we understand again that prophecies are often fulfilled in stages. And this prophecy is an example of that. We'll talk about verse 10. That's an example of the prophecy being fulfilled in stages. I think it's also important to understand the language used here. He regularly says, on that day, on that day, on that day, I will do this. On that day, this will happen. On that day. You find this phrase regularly throughout prophecies, regularly throughout the prophets. Sometimes it'll be on the day of the Lord. It's an expression that refers to the coming of God in power to set the affairs right on earth in salvation and in judgment. And so some of the prophecies we look at, they're fulfilled in Christ in his first coming in salvation, and they will be fulfilled again in his second coming in judgment. 
And so often the, the Old Testament begins to point forward to his first coming, his first fulfillment in the first century. And then the promises we find in the New Testament points to his second coming, the second fulfillment. Zechariah 12 is a twofold prophecy. One that was fulfilled in our past and one that is to be fulfilled in our future. And we find ourselves somewhere in the middle. Now, why do I think this is important to draw your attention to? Because I need to be encouraged. I think we need to be encouraged. Encouraged to hope. Encouraged to hold on to the promises that God is for you. That God is for his people in the midst of the overwhelmedness. We pause to glimpse at the life and death and resurrection of Jesus thousands of years ago, which were a fulfillment of these very prophecies 500 years earlier. No Roman at the cross was going, well, we should make sure we stab him in the side because we want to fulfill the Zechariah prophecy. To be encouraged that God is for you in the midst of the storm. To have hope rather than hopelessness. This week I found it fascinating to read studies on the concept of hope and of hopelessness. First, I find it fascinating to try and scientifically study something that's intangible. But one conclusion that was found was in order to address the global epidemic of loneliness and to prevent suicide, we must address the underlying effects of hopelessness. People without hope. The studies at some level acknowledge what we already inherently knew, what Scripture points us to, that there is hope in the midst of the storm if you put your hope in Him. I'm sure there are some that are listening that are feeling hopeless. Some that are listening that are feeling anxious, overwhelmed, ready to throw in the towel. Many moms and dads since spring have been thrown into the role of teacher and tech support on top of always being needed, always being nagged at, always being snipped at and yelled at. My call is that you would lift your heads and anchor in the words of on that day the Lord will shield those who live in Jerusalem so that the feeblest among you will be like David. He is for you, in spite of you. May you be encouraged in the midst of the overwhelmedness. I pray that you would have hope in these moments that God's promises still stand, even though we're in the middle, even though we haven't seen or experienced or seen or touched Jesus or his disciples. This week, uh, the the team, we get together weekly to read Scripture and pray. And uh, this week, Doug, Brent, Cheryl, Kevin was away this week. But we got together and we were reading the story of Exodus. And it's a story where Pharaoh frees the Israelites and how God will cause Pharaoh to free the Israelites from enslavement. He's talking to Moses at this point. And we often read the Scripture and then we pause to just let, let us share a little bit about what's jumping out to us, what speaks to us in the moment. And I pause and I began to think about the timeline. From the beginning of the time of their slavery to the time of their freedom was 430 years. I imagine what must, it, what must have it been like for someone 200 years in? Being told of the stories of God's work in the lives of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, yet never seeing it with their own eyes and the thought that that was 200 years of enslavement, when will there be freedom? Imagine the people felt the same hopelessness, the same despondency, the same overwhelmness. And we know from history that this would not be the only moment. Large swaths of oppression. And still in many of those stories and in many of the stories, we find stories of hope, acts of stealth, Stealth altruism that bring goodness in places where it doesn't seem like there could be. Just look up stories of hope from the Holocaust. 
and how they survived in those moments. It was to be encouraged by the fact that God is for you in spite of you. That God defends and shields and uplifts in spite of us. It's not because of us that he saves us. Because we have to get to that second point. In spite of you. Because the second part of the prophecy, verses 10 through 14, deal with us coming to grips with our own rejection of God. Our own rebellion towards him. Our own trampling on his love toward us. We must come to a place of mourning. But in that, we also find thanksgiving. But first we have to start by repenting of how we've chosen arrogant pride in ourselves, pride in our rights, rather than humble reliance on the God who died for us. We must face our true colors in the light of his true colors. What are his true colors? On the day that he was crucified, the ones that were nailing him, beating him, piercing him, he looks at and says, Father, forgive them. In this moment in verse 10, we find its first fulfillment in John 19, 36 through 37. We find Jesus talking about he was pierced and, and John references this very verse. And many of those present mourn over what just happened. Mourn over what they have done. And Revelation chapter 1 verse 7 is where the second fulfillment of this verse is, is talked about. In his second coming, all will see him. All will see the one that they have pierced. And all will mourn. But rather than wait till that day to wrestle with our own rejection and rebellion, will you do that today? The call for us today is will we mourn over what happened that day? Do we see the depths of our rebellion to the Creator? See, the focus is, is less on really a list of inappropriate behaviors and rather on the relational issue rising from us turning our back on God, rising from us rejecting Him, our infidelity to Him. Focusing on whether or not I cuss misses the point of the deeper rebellion in my heart. We turn our back on Him when we look for answers, for hope, for encouragement, other places, somewhere else, whether it's myself and my own reason and rationality, whether it's a political party or a candidate or academia or science, when we rest our hope somewhere else besides him, besides the one who in verse 1 says, stretches out the heavens, lays out the foundations of the earth, who forms the human spirit within a person, the one who creates, when we look for our hope somewhere else, we are in rebellion to the one true king. And for that, he died. And the call of verses 10 through 14 is the call of repentance. And yet thanksgiving that he would die for you, that he is for you in spite of you. And, and, and repentance is not simply an action. God wants your heart. He wants our hearts. And, uh, the act of repentance is like me telling my five-year-old, you need to say sorry to your brother. And from across the room without even looking at him, he says, sorry, there I said it. That's the act of repentance, but that's not the heart of repentance. God's desire is for our hearts to be turned to him, to be changed by him. If you happen to know Vicki Vincent, she used to always say, it's a heart issue. So the heart of true repentance is one of godly sorrow for our rebellion and for our treason. Think about relationships. What, what restores the breach, what restores the break is often genuine sorrow. Heartfelt sorrow 
for how we fed into the broken relationship. Genuine remorse, is oft, genuine remorse often restores unions. At least it's the beginning of it. And so the call to repentance here, the heart of repentance here is, is one of confession and one of brokenness, one of admitting and humbling. And Zechariah's call this morning is for each person to wrestle with this, for us to wrestle in our own hearts. The call to repentance. The call to admitting and humbling. But Zechariah also gives a vision for a community. If you look at this passage, it's the land, the community, the clans, the people will mourn. He gives a vision for a community who repents, a community who confesses. I believe is another timely passage in the, in, the, in the day that we are in. As we discuss larger systemic challenges in our culture, will we join as a people in confessing, in repenting? We've referenced John Perkins before in his book, One Blood. He says, I know that confession and brokenness are almost un-American terms. We pride ourselves on our rugged individualism and our right to be right. So it may not be American to admit our faults and humble ourselves before one another, but if we want to be like Christ, that is what we must do. Are we willing to admit and humble ourselves and see how our own rebellion has a ripple effect to our communities and our neighbors? Are we willing to repent and mourn and weep over our sin and the effect that it has? In student ministry, we've been working through uh, James, and we were in James 3 uh, a couple uh, last week. And in James 3, 9, it says, With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Are we willing to own the ways in which we bless God and curse other human beings. We're less than 100 days away from the election. How do I talk about the candidate that I don't like? How do I talk about the people that will vote for the candidate that I don't like? They are made in God's likeness, just as I am. Seeing the, the weight of my own rebellion, and even in a moment like that, seeing the weight of my own attitude and reaction towards other people should break my heart because it's a trampling on his love for us. And repentance has to, not, has to go past being an action to being a heart matter. To pass, it has to go past also than simply sorrow for the consequence. Mourning for getting caught in sin is a far cry from what we find in Scripture. My heart is attempting to run away from you, God. To find my hope and myself and my encouragement elsewhere. This is illustrated by Jesus himself in Matthew 18, 21 through 35. Peter asks him about forgiveness. He asks him uh, about this idea, and so Jesus gives a story where he tells a story. Maybe you've heard this story. He tells a story of a king who forgives a huge amount owed by one of his servants, someone that, that, that worked for him, and this individual is now free and forgiven, and what does he do? He goes out and he finds somebody who owes him 20 bucks, and he does not extend the same forgiveness. He does not extend the same grace and mercy, even as the peer asks for it. What the king did for him hadn't worked its way deep enough into his heart. 
brokenness and confession and mourning and repentance and forgiveness that touches the heart can't help but pour out to others. The depths to which we understand this and believe that God is for us in spite of us, that God grants forgiveness in spite of us, the depths to which we grasp that will affect the outflow that we show it to others around us. When the object of your faith, when you begin to truly see the loveliness and the boundless mercy and grace extended at the cross, the beauty and the excellency of him who is pierced, when you look to Jesus, we can't, I can't help but mourn and be thankful because it was my sin that held him there. Brian Gregory, one commentator, puts it, it's precisely the moment of the crucifixion that we see how amazing God's grace is. At the cross, we're shown our God-killing hearts and we're shown God's humanity-loving heart. We see our desire to flee from God and we see God's desire to pursue us. We see our desire to pick up the piercing spear against God, and we see God's desire to pick up the piercing nails for us. The only proper response is mourning and thankful joy. We mourn because what we have done and what we continue to do. We mourn because we keep running away. We keep trying to remove God from our lives. And yet we rejoice with thankfulness. We rejoice because we are pursued by a God who loves a flock in flight. We rejoice because we have a God who reveals his indescribable glory and inexhaustible grace, even through the piercing of his one and only Son. And as he pours out his grace and mercy upon us, how can we not do the same for others around us? In closing, this prophecy is really an invitation. An invitation to see and believe in a God who would have mercy on us in spite of us. A God who is committed to us, not because of us, in spite of us. And the second invitation is then to live out that grace and mercy to those around you. God, for some mysterious reason, chooses to work through us as his agents of grace and mercy. He works through us to be examples of the love that he's shown to others around us. I pray that we might be a people who overflows with grace and mercy, living out the very spirit which he has poured on us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you that you are for us in spite of us. Thank you that you would be a God who promises and stands by your promises to defend, shield, uplift, and renew. Father, I pray that you would bring hope and encouragement this morning in the promises of who you are. What you accomplished in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus and have applied to us. And may that encouragement and that hope in the midst of overwhelmingness, in the midst of hopelessness, stir hope in us. And Father, may we face honestly the ways in which we still run away. The ways in which we still trample your love. The ways in which we claim your promises for us, but so often then don't turn around and pour out on others. Or at least we often only pour them out on the people that we like and are like us. Thank you for not doing that for me, God. Because I know your word says, while we were still sinners, while we were your enemies, you died for us. How great.
great are you, God? How great. May our song rise to you, Lord, in praise of a God who would pursue, a God who is for us in spite of us. Your name, amen.
May that tune perch itself on your heart today as you go from this place and be encouraged of how great our God is, that he is for you in spite of you. I would encourage you, whatever means you use to give your tithes or your offerings, whether online or if you're here in in the boxes, use that as an opportunity to pause and to say thank you. Don't just rush past that moment because as we give, we are reminded of how he gives for us. If you're in need of prayer, uh, just let your usher know as they let you out. For those that are here, ushers will release you into uh, the aisles or or by row. uh, But if you need prayer, just mention to an usher, I'd love to pray with one of the pastors. They'll happily pray for you. Receive the Lord's blessing as you go. May the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, may he equip you with everything good, working in you that which is pleasing in his sight. And all God's people said, amen.